Tov. So now um, what we're looking at here is uh, a scroll from Cave 11 in Qumran, one sheet of the Psalm scroll. And this scroll is very interesting because, first of all, it's beautifully written in square Hebrew writing. Anyone who reads Hebrew can very simply read here, Shir ma'alot David hine matov manaim shevet achim gam yachad. The entire scroll is written in square Hebrew script, save for one word, the holy name, which repeats itself over and over again, and is written in ancient Hebrew script, probably because either that was thought of as a more holy writing, or because they didn't want someone to read off the scroll uh, and say the name uh, accidentally. Interestingly, we see a few interesting things in this scroll. For example, we can see scrapings of mistakes that the scribe made to remove the words, uh, that weren't supposed to be there. However, one word you cannot erase, and that's the name of God. And so when it was written accidentally, in order to mark the spot and show that the, the word shouldn't appear there, the scribe put dots above and below each letter, marking that that word should not appear there. Another interesting thing about the scroll that you can see is that the entire bottom of the scroll is darkened to the point where it's not legible and not, not, we're not able to read it. Uh, this darkening is not caused by burning, but rather by exposure to moisture or water, which causes gelatinization, which is a process of the breaking down of the collagen of the, of the uh, parchment. And using our special imaging system, we're able to lighten the parchment and bring out the charcoal of the ink so that this whole section is re, re, uh, eligible and able to be read. Our imaging system was established some 12 years ago. Um, after about 20 years of work of the Dead Sea Scrolls Conservation Laboratory, where the, conser the conservators worked on the scrolls, uh, we realized that we needed to have some kind of system in order to monitor their status and situation in order to make sure that A, what we were doing was actually good for the scrolls, and B, if anything was happening to them that wasn't good, we could catch it and correct ourselves or take care of the scroll in order to prevent further damage. And so a special imaging system, which was built um, following technology developed by NASA using multispectral imaging, was set up with um, set parameters that don't change, and each scroll is photographed using 12 wavelengths and 28 exposures on each side, creating a situation where each scroll, each fragment, however small it is, has about um, 58 photos, about 3.6 gigabytes of data, and uh, roughly we have a few hundred terabytes of data put together all together, and these are then can be used to compare uh, between the situation of the scroll that was photographed a year ago and photographed yesterday and say, oh wait, it's all good, we're in the clear, or something has happened and we need to make corrections. Um, so what we're looking at here is a Greek copy of the Book of Twelve Minor Prophets. The Book of Twelve Minor Prophets is a known scroll in the Judean desert. The fact that this one is written in Greek is not so surprising because we need to relate to Greek as the English of that time period. It was the international language, and so there were people who read Greek, and we even know of the translation of the, all the biblical books into Greek as the Septuagint. Interestingly, this uh, scroll, which came to us in the 1950s, found by looters who brought them to the scholars working on the scrolls, is written in Greek, save for one word. One word, which repeats itself over and over, the holy name of God, okay, which is written in ancient Hebrew script, 
which was still popular and known in the Second Temple period, even though most Hebrew was written in square Hebrew script. But for the use of the, of the holy name, they would write it in ancient Hebrew, perhaps because this was thought of as a holier script, or perhaps because they didn't want anyone to read it by accident as they were reading the scroll and, and pronounce the name of God. The Israel Antiquities Authority uh, is in charge of roughly 1,000 manuscripts made up of 25,000 fragments. When most people think of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they think of a couple of things. They think of Qumran, of course, one of the most important sites of discovery, and the Shrine of the Book at the Israel Museum, where they can see the original seven scrolls found in the first cave in Qumran. However, that was just the first cave and that was just the first site. Uh, our collection houses some 1,000 manuscripts spreading over a period of roughly 1,800 years uh, in different locations in the Judean desert. And um, this collection is primarily conserved in the Israel Antiquities Authority's laboratories. That's our primary concern, is to make sure if these scrolls survive for hundreds and thousands of years, that we make sure that they continue to survive, but also to provide the information to the general public through the World Wide Web, the digital library, which makes uh, the photographs of the scrolls accessible, and to study these scrolls using modern research methods. However, once in a while we get really lucky, and about five years ago the Israel Antiquities Authority decided that enough was enough. We needed to go out there and be there before the looters because the Judean desert is prone to looting because it's at a distance, there aren't a lot of settlements, and of course there's the potential of finding scrolls. And so it's been prone to looting. And five years ago a team went out to survey the desert, find spots where there was potential to excavate and find uh, artifacts prior to their looting and excavate in those places. And in one of those excavations, the Cave of the Horror, where this was found, additional fragments of the same scroll were found. Now these are fragments also written in Greek and also very important because they help connect between the cave and the scroll. And this scroll is very interesting because we're talking about a scroll that was written in the first century BC or first century AD, but it only arrived at the cave some hundred years later during the Bar Kokhva revolt when refugees escaped to the desert in order to hide. Now when people escape, they take with them what they need to survive, but they also take with them things that are close to their heart. And apparently this scroll, which was already some hundred years old, was close to the heart of those who ran away to this cave to hide in order to wait for the Romans to leave so that they could come out and renew their lives. In this case, unfortunately, um, they met their death in the cave, uh, leaving behind these archaeological finds for us to discover. What we're looking at here is, again, from the period of the Bar Kokhva revolt, 60 years after the destruction of the temple, when the Jews revolt a second time against the Roman Empire, and after several years of battles, they realize that this is lost, and they escape as refugees to the caves in the Judean desert, and they hide out. And we saw before that they take with them biblical scrolls, but not only biblical scrolls do we find, but also um, documents about the administration of the rebellion, including some documents which, are, uh, which mention none other than Shimon Bar Kochva himself, Shimon ben Koziba. And here we see one of those documents relating to the administration of the rebellion. Um, it's easy to note that in this case, we're not looking at parchment, parchment which is made of animal skin, but rather papyrus, which has a much better, we a much more a distinct weave.
So if we were talking about uh, the second Jewish revolt, the Bar Kokhba revolt, and we saw administrative documents from that rebellion, we also have stories which are a little bit more about the individuals, about the refugees who escaped to these caves. One of the most interesting stories is um, a woman who, was, who lived on the opposite side of the Jordan. Her husband died, and then she remarried to a man in, in Gedi, and she finds herself a refugee uh, escaping to the caves. And she brings with her a small purse with her personal documents, including her personal life. Uh, and uh, this was a woman who was of a high economic uh, level, so she had lands. And for example, the document that we're looking on is a deed of sale of a date crop, uh, which she sold. And it's interesting because this is written in three different languages, in Greek, in Nabataean, and in Aramaic. And the last line of the Aramaic it states that the, this hereby certifies that uh, you know what was written in the rest of the document. So it's really a legal binding document. The last scroll I want to speak about uh, is actually our oldest scroll. It dates back to the first temple period. Uh, roughly the 8th, 7th century BCE. Um, and it's very interesting. It's a papyrus, um, and it actually has two layers of writing. An earlier letter, which was written, which is an interesting letter of someone writing to his colleague saying, don't believe what you hear about me. And then at a certain point, that letter was no longer interesting, and so it was erased, and a second layer of a different administrative document was written above it. So we've spoken about uh, the conservation of the scrolls. We've spoken about the content of the scrolls, uh, about the imaging, the unique imaging of the scrolls. What I want to spend the next few minutes is talking about the future research of the scrolls and some of the things we've been doing, which are quite interesting, using new tools and technologies that weren't available to the first scholars who, which can now provide a lot more new information about the scrolls. I'm going to start with an incredible story about the excavations of the synagogue in Gedi, uh, excavations by the Hebrew University in the 1970s, where they found what they believed were the scrolls which stood in the ark in the synagogue. However, the synagogue was burned down, and what they suspected were scrolls actually just looked like chunks of charcoal, sort of like last night's barbecue. Um, and they knew they had something, so they kept it anyways. They marked it as a possible scroll, but they, hadn't, they had nothing to do with it. And it sat in storerooms for a good 40 years uh, until um, the retirement of the excavator. And then he brought the materials over to us. And we didn't have what to do with it at first until we began uh, being exposed to the world of CT scanning. And we took this, this burnt charcoal uh, to a micro CT scanner and scanned it. And in the scanning, you could already see that there were layers. And so this became clear that the excavators were in fact correct, that this was a scroll that had been rolled up. And uh, not only that, but you could see the writing. And that writing uh, was clear to be Hebrew, but it couldn't be connected because we we're talking about layers and layers and layers. And so we partnered up with Brent Seals at the University of Kentucky, who using computer algorithms was able to separate the different layers and then flatten them out so that they could be read completely and join them. And that's how we uh, acquired um, the scroll of Leviticus dating to the third, fourth centuries CE. Uh, which was burnt in the synagogue in Ein Gedi in the Byzantine period. So this is one of the future directions of research. Another future direction is using computers uh, to see things that we can't. For example, um, a team from Kroningen, headed by Professor Mladen Popovich, uh, who is using artificial intelligence on our photographs to identify the different scribes used to write the scrolls. Um, 
if I write my name today and I write my name tomorrow, it may look different. But what they claim is that my motions, my hand motions will remain the same. And if I can identify the hand motions of different scribes, then this can help contribute to understanding scribal practices, to, con to understand chronologies of different scrolls, when different scribes were active, and uh, to also help maybe piece together certain scrolls, certain fragments, which were either joined uh, wrongly or not joined, and now using this technology, perhaps we can be doing this. Another use of the computer that we're doing is providing um, open access tools for the research of scrolls to be able to look at our photos, look at the transcript of the scroll, and then change that transcript, suggest different readings, uh, complete the uh, uh, things that are missing, uh, perhaps join different fragments which weren't joined, and these are all things that are up and coming in the virtual world. Another important aspect of new research is analytical research or scientific research, analyzing the materials used to write the scrolls and that they were written on. So for example, uh, one of the recent studies that was done, it managed to obtain the DNA of the parchment of different scrolls. A team from Tel Aviv University together with the Israel Antiquities Authority teamed up to basically come together and define the DNA of different scrolls. Now most of the DNA identified animals that we would expect, but one of the scrolls was found to have been used uh, to have been written on cow parchment. And cow doesn't usually belong in the desert. And so this is one of the signals that this specific scroll had been written elsewhere and brought to the Judean desert. And so this is another new avenue of research. And the last thing I'll speak about are the uh, analyses, of, analyses of ink that we've been doing uh, recently. Now, one of the big issues about doing scientific analyses on the scrolls is that uh, a lot of analyses are destructive. If I want to do carbon dating or if I want to do DNA, I have to actually take a piece of scroll and destroy it. And one of the issues is that we're tr constantly trying to balance whether we should be sacrificing this part of the scroll or not. Um, and so one of the things we've been looking for are avenues of research that do analytical studies without actually causing damage. And a, a wonderful study recently published by our team together with uh, people from the Weizmann Institute found a special system in which a special film is placed on the scroll and it extracts the proteins. And these proteins can be used to define the, uh, the makeup of the ink used to write the scroll without causing any damage. And this can be very, very useful in understanding where the scrolls were written according to the ink recipes, scribal practices, different scribal schools, and so on and so forth. And so these are the avenues of research for the future of the scrolls.